The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Well, welcome back into the House of Mystery. And of course, I'm Al Warren. Mr. Michael Holly is in the room. Hello, Al. This is going to be a great one. Yeah, right down your alley, that's for sure. How coincidental that Monday I have a co-lecture with a local authority on Sherlock Holmes. We're doing Sherlock Holmes versus Jack the Ripper lecture, so I'm excited to talk to Les. <laughs> Great. Who's who's that? Oh, we have uh, the local uh, authority. His name is Kevin Gallivan. I have not come across Kevin, but... Uh, so I'm going to ask Kevin about Les. <laughs> all, all good. All good. Get the gossip, you know. That's right. Um, yeah, so you're doing. I see you're doing a couple of talks. I've noticed I on um, because um, I've had to, I've shared them and I you're doing a couple yes. of things. Yes, yeah, and I uh, re, and yeah another one uh, on again Francis Tumbley who who I do, but uh, also it's based on a little bit of uh, Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde, which is another reason why I wanted to talk to Les. <laughs> Great. Well, Holmes and the Ripper is always the right topic. I, I did a little piece for a magazine that I'm sure you get, Michael, a Ripperologist. Oh, yes. I did a little piece uh, a few years ago for them about the Richard Block, uh, Jack the Ripper, Jack El Distrippador, uh, which is a great Holmes Ripper crossover. Oh, that's great, because Adam Wood, who does that Ripperologist, Al and I had actually interviewed just a little bit ago. It's it's a hardcore community of uh, Scholars, I won't say fans. You can't be fans of Jack. No. Oh, we have, we have, we have definitely lots of groups. But like uh, for me, is uh, I I love uh, using reprologists because when I do my research, I want people to literally rip into it. Just to uh, it's kind of like our peer review in a way. So it works that way. Well, I always I always want to plug my dear friend Lindsay Fay's uh, wonderful book, Dust and Shadow which is uh, the finest of the Holmes meets the Ripper uh, pastiche has ever written. Uh, if you haven't read it, it's definitely worth reading. I, she she wrote it when she was in her 20s, and I read it for her in manuscript, and I kept saying to myself, I'm going to catch all these mistakes. And, wow, she had really done her homework, <laughs> and uh, it, it's a terrific book. Uh, what's the name of the book again? Dust and Shadow. I've heard of it. I haven't read it, though. Lindsay Fay. Mm-hmm. Writing that one down now. Yeah, write it down. So now the, the, the third voice you hear is Mr. Leslie S. Klinger, and he's got a new book out called The New Annotated Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And uh, welcome to the show, of course. Um, Thank you. Les, so how did, how did this all happen to you? Like, how did you get involved with this and you're doing the annotated versions? Yeah, so when I was in law school, so I'm a lawyer by day at, and uh, it, I, I keep assuring my wife I'm never going to give up the day job because uh, it's hard to make a living as a writer of the kind of books I do. Um, well, when I when I was in law school many years ago, um, I discovered an amazing book called The Annotated Sherlock Holmes by an author named William S. Beringul. It came out in 1968, and it was... Um, Put out by Clarkson Potter. It was one, it was only really sort of the second big annotated book that sort of hit the public market. The first one was uh, the annotated Alice in Wonderland, um, by Martin Gardner. And then they published Baron Gould. And I, I read the Baron Gould and I was fascinated. I, I had, like many people, I was sort of vaguely familiar with Sherlock Holmes. I probably read one or two stories. Uh, but I was fascinated not only by the stories, but by the depth of amateur scholarship that was on display in these footnotes, not just by Berengold, but by hundreds of nutcases like me who loved Sherlock Holmes and wanted to do more. So for a long time, I was just a collector. But in the 90s, I decided that I could contribute to the amateur scholarship. And I started writing essays. And then eventually decided that I could re-annotate the stories, that Baring Gould's footnotes, while they were great, were 25, 30 years out of date already at that point. Um, 
And so I started doing it. I just sort of took it up and I started creating a series of books that later became known as the Sherlock Holmes Reference Library. These were heavily, heavily annotated, footnoted uh, versions of the original stories. Uh, a friend of mine called my writing style Law Review, and it wasn't a compliment. <laughs> they, but they, were, they were talking about sort of if you ever see a law review, you, you see a page with a line of text and the entire rest of the page is footnote. And that was my writing. So anyway, I was doing that. And in 2002, I got a call out of the blue from a senior editor at, uh, at Norton who said, we're going to redo that old Baron Gould book. And we hear you should edit the new edition. It was like, Wow, I'm a lawyer, uh, you know, and um, so I did. Um, I was very fortunate. Uh, the book, uh, the book won the Edgar uh, for best critical biographical, and I thought to myself, "Gee, I must be God's gift to writers. Why have I been holding back all these years?" <laughs> so um, anyway, I loved the process and the writing community so much that I said, "You know, I can do more." So I dove in, and the next book I did was Dracula, and the next book I did after that was um, uh, loved more and more. There was just it became a stream of these heavily annotated texts, all aimed at sort of the popular market, but nonetheless, because uh, I'm not a scholar, I'm not an academic, um, but uh, there seemed to be an audience for this. So at this point, I've done. Uh, Sherlock Holmes, which is 3,000 pages, uh, Frankenstein, Dracula, uh, two volumes of H.P. Lovecraft. Um, I did the annotated Sandman, which is uh, the brilliant uh, series of graphic novels. I did the annotated Watchmen. Um, I did annotated American Gods, uh, classic American crime fiction of the 1920s. And so now, finally, uh, this Jekyll and Hyde. Finally, I don't mean most recently is a better word. Not finally. <laughs> right. <laughs> Not your last. Not my last. How do you go about doing it? Well, yeah. I mean, there's a whole process, but it basically involves reading very slowly. Um, it means looking at the text in such depth that you say to yourself, what does this word mean? What is, what is he talking about here? Uh, what, what, what is she trying to get across in this sentence? Uh, really parsing out the, it, with a fine tooth comb, uh, the choice of words, the, um, absurdities in the action, uh, historical references, cultural references, social references. And then, I mean, I always say, look, these are great books. They don't need less clinger to be great books. Um, my idea is to try and enhance the reader's experience, sort of like the director's track on a DVD or something. Not that I'm the director, but I mean, to, to give the reader a supplement, more, more about the things they're reading. And, um, it, it's, I, it started out for me. I was one of these people who talked to the screen in the movie theater. That's great. Look at that scene. Oh, this is just like that over there and it drove my wife crazy. Uh, so I, I channeled those bad urges into more socially acceptable channels. Do you find you have to be kind of careful on how you how you do that and kind of what? Well, in theaters, yes. I try not to enjoy the pain. Well, yeah. <laughs> but um, so there is a there is a selectivity. Um, many of the books that I have annotated are books where somebody else has done it before me, either an academic. Or in some cases, early popular editions. There was a, there was a writer named Leonard Wolf who did, um, an annotated Dracula. He did an annotated, uh, uh, Frankenstein. Um, and I think he even did annotated Jekyll and Hyde many years ago, back in the seventies. And, um, so I, I want to look at what those other writers did. And generally, if they wrote a footnote about it, I probably want to write a footnote about it, too. But not always. I try to be selective. But Baron Gould, for example, was fascinated in the Sherlock Holmes stories with the subject known to Sherlockians as chronology, meaning 
when did the events described in this story actually take place? Um, I do spend some time on that with some of these things, but I try not to be obsessed with it as Baron Gould was. Uh, so, for example, Dracula. Uh, there's a real question about what, when did that, when did the events in the story take place? It's, it's very specific about dates, but the dates don't quite work on a calendar um, and uh, so on. So there's, there's all kinds of sort of sub subjects uh, language. I mean, when you're doing Victorian books, Michael, uh, as a ripperologist, I know, you know, this, you know, we don't speak Victorian English. Oh, for sure. There are so many phrases and words that meant something different then um, and social customs that yeah. were just different. then. The for example, there's a scene in Frankenstein where the, I, I'm sorry, in Dracula, where Lucy leaves her visiting card at somebody's house. What does that mean? You know, we don't do that anymore. It was a thing. You left a calling card at somebody's house saying you'd been there. One of the things I wanted to try to do on my a fiction novel that I wrote uh, called The Ripper's Hellbroth about Jack the Ripper, I was looking for 19th century jokes. And 99.9% of them we can't use today because, boy, do they rip on the Irish. They rip on everyone. It's just uh, mm -hmm. so, well, that was inappropriate. Can't do that one. <laughs> so. Well, you you got to look hard. I, uh, there's one of my uh, favorite illustrations that I've forgotten which book I put it in. It may have been Sherlock Holmes. I'm, I'm trying to remember the relevance. But it shows... Uh, um, a, a, an older woman walking on the street, she's talking to her girlfriend and she's all covered with bandages and bruises and a black eye. And one of them says, uh, Oh, uh, Joe's home from work again. Uh, and it, you know, it's about violence against women, domestic abuse, but it was, and, and of course the prevalence of alcohol and, and, uh, drunkenness and in, in lower class society in England, you know, they, they poked fun at themselves. They made fun of it. Uh, it's not so funny anymore. But. Right, right. And then even uh, with the uh, the unfortunates, you know, they, they used to say, uh, you want to do the business. Although then when you watch some movies, I, I just watched uh, one uh, Sherlock Holmes versus Jack Ripper on TV called uh, Something Terror. That A Study in Terror, my favorite Sherlock Holmes movie. Oh, okay. And then uh, I just, I just re remember when one of the... The unfortunates said something outside that, oh, I, that's not what they mean. <laughs> so, I, right. Well, it's, it, it's, it, it's partly about prostitution. So, um, yeah, there's, a, there's, that's such a great movie. Don, John Neville plays Holmes. Oh, Donald yes. Houston plays Watson. Uh, it's got the one, wonderful Anthony Quayle in it. And best of all, it has Robert Morley playing the part of Mycroft Holmes, Sherlock's older brother. Oh, yeah. Um, who is the spitting image of Mycroft from the Sydney Paget illustration? <laughs> so, and there's also, by the way, a very good book. It was it was novelized by Ellery Queen. Um, so, watch for it. Study in Terror. Study in Terror. I'll look for that too. But I, it was so funny. I just watched that, and then uh, we get the interview less, and then I get to talk to more more about Sherlock Holmes and stuff. So it's interesting. <laughs> what do you think the um... Well, actually, before I get into that, uh, do you learn something each time you do one of these books? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I um, have started some, some of the books. I mean, Sherlock Holmes and Dracula, I had spent a lot of time with before I began annotating them. Uh, the other books I had read once. And so when you go back to them and and annotate, I mean, one of the one of the warnings, one of the bits of advice I give to writers who think they're going to write a, a book kind of, and that doesn't have to be annotated, but a book about another book is you better really like that book <laughs> because you're, you're going to spend a lot of time with it. Um, and the, the pleasure, the joy of doing something like Jekyll and Hyde is how brilliant it is. Uh, and this is a book that um, we'll, we'll talk about, in a few minutes, I'm sure we'll talk about movies of the, of the book and all that. But this is a book that's been adapted many, many times. And, it, and like Frankenstein or Dracula, therefore, it's one of these stories that everybody thinks they know. 
um, until they read the book. And then they say, oh, this is considerably different. Um, so one of the great pleasures of, of doing Jekyll and Hyde was reminding myself, I'd like to think, of the incredibly meticulous craftsmanship that Stevenson used in, in creating this story. It's got a shocking ending. Uh, this is a story that was described by one critic as uh, uh, a, a mystery in which the solution is more shocking than the crime. Um, and when you read it, know, knowing when you know the ending, when you sort of know the surprise and you go back and read it again, one of the things that I saw and learned was just how beautifully crafted it is with its buildup of clues, uh, hints, and and suspense in getting toward that ending. Um, that it's all there, it, but but as you're reading it for the first time, it's this great mystery. It, it's kind of strange. What do you think the fascination is with some of these stories that stay around years and years, and they keep coming back and keep coming back? What is it the is it the detail in the writing? Is it uh, what is it that I yeah. think it's I think it's a combination of things, of course. Uh, part part of it, I mean, there is a certain element of nostalgia for the Victorian age, uh, uh, or, or sort of invented nostalgia because none of us really remember Victoriana, but um, we have this vague idea that it was a golden age, and so. Reading these, I mean, Michael, certainly you know better. Um, if you studied the Ripper at all, you really studied the incredibly ugly side of life in the big city. Oh, yeah. Um, sure. uh, you know, alcohol and abuse and, uh, and crime. Tale of two cities with London. Yeah. So nostalgia is a small part of it. I think in each of these, it's the plasticity, if, if you will. It's the, it's the iconic nature of the central characters or the stories. Um, so we can talk for hours about Sherlock Holmes and why people admire or want to be Sherlock Holmes or want to be like Sherlock Holmes. That's a whole, that's a whole deep discussion. But jumping to the others, I mean, um, we're fascinated by a figure like Dracula or a figure like the creature in Frankenstein. Um, outside of society and yet very much part of society and therefore giving the writer the ability to comment on society. But there's also a certain immortality to these characters. The, the things that they're about are timeless. Jekyll and Hyde is a timeless story about um, hypocrisy, about what what Stevenson called the war, that old war of the members. Um, that is to say, the dueling nature of human beings that we have, we all have our Jekylls and our Hydes inside us and struggle to reconcile. Them. It, it's, it's not a story that is in any way locked into Victorian England. You can move it just like you can with Holmes and Dracula and Frankenstein and all those, you can pick it up and move it to any time and it works. And, and that timelessness, that depth, I think is what makes these books. It, it's, it's why they endure because they are so plastic and can be molded to fit any time or place. The, uh, Mansfield's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, uh, the performed, Right at the beginning of the the Ripper murders, as a matter of fact, the first day it performed, it was uh, August fourth, August fifth. It made the papers, and August sixth is when the uh, arguably the first Ripper murder occurred. Yeah. And then uh, no one knows this. What I just found out was, uh, it's going to be part of my next uh, book is that that the very first time uh, at the Lyceum Theater when they canceled the show. Four hours later was the double event murder where two women were cur were murdered. So, uh, but then they kind of continued the show afterwards. But, but the public thought it was done. So here is if if Jack the Ripper was this person looking for this elixir, uh, that uh, that would have been inspiration. And then next thing you know, he would have been quite upset that uh, the show was canceled. Right. He was a he was a pissed off theater goer. <laughs> exactly. His ticket was canceled. 
So no, it's it's remarkable coincidence here. And of course, th- that era is also Dracula's time. Oh yeah, uh, Bram Stoker was very much an overlap of the exact time periods. Um, we could go Dracula and the Ripper is a whole other deep subject. So uh, that's but that's what the Ripper's haunt is actually about because uh, Bram Stoker was uh, at the Lyme- Lyceum Theater when he was a business manager and his. His best pal was Henry Hall Kane, who was the boyfriend of the guy I researched, Tumblebee. <laughs> so it's a lot, definitely. Yes. Well, they all knew each other. It was a small circle of literary friends and colleagues. I mean, Conan Doyle knew Stoker, um, and uh, uh, they just were, you know, it was, a, it was a small group of people. Stevenson knew them all, too. Wow. Uh, so this is a time, I mean, there's no question in my mind that Stevenson very much wanted to explore the hypocrisy of the era as well. But this is a time when, uh, you know, we sort of put ourselves back into Victorian times when there was a great deal of stress on propriety, um, uh, outwardly proper living. At the same time, there was a great deal of private sinning going on, uh, this was the time of the great scandals of child prostitution rings. Oh, yes. Uh, of course, homosexuality was a crime. Gross and indecency, was, yes. Right. And there were, there were prosecutions. This is Oscar Wilde time. Uh, and so it's interesting that people think of Mr. Hyde as this uh, evil, vicious creature. We're not sure what sins he's committing other than a murder. I mean, we definitely know he commits a murder, but what else is he doing? And what is it that Dr. Jekyll is covering up? What is it that he is deeply repenting um, from his past? Was it homosexuality? Was it hanging out with prostitutes? This is an unusual book, and there's it, it's it's deliberately ambiguous. But of course, as you've pointed out, Michael, the public reacted to it immediately, and there were sermons all over the place about uh, uh, this book and uh, and the the wages of sin. Question then, uh, with both that and Dracula, uh, there's been people that are believe there's codes in there. Um, would you uh, how how do you, how's your take on that? You, you mean secret messages? Kind of, like what, what they're talking about maybe possibly is a actual person, actual events that are happening, kind of. Ah, yeah. Well, I haven't seen any. I mean, certainly there were historical figures that inspired Stevenson. Um, one of them is a, is a man named Deacon Brody. Uh, this was a figure about whom Stevenson and his friend William Henley actually wrote a play. Uh, Deacon Brody was a um, a man who led a very respectable life by day. He was a deacon of the church, uh, and by night was the leader of a gang of thieves, oh. uh, and eventually caught and exposed. And that dual life, that that um, hypocrisy, fascinated Stevenson, uh, and I think Stevenson also felt that he himself was a hypocrite. Uh, he had been expected by his family to become uh, an architect um, and to lead a sort of suitably professional class life in, in London, but he really wanted to be an artist. And, of course, he ended up bailing on uh, England altogether and moving to the South Pacific. Um, but uh, so he, it was it was partly about himself, um, but... I, I don't know that he had a very specific pe- person in mind. Un- unlike Frankenstein, where we can point to sort of scientists of the day who were interested in um, the creation of life, I'm not aware of any sp- specific science that was undertaken here that had to do with the kind of things that Jekyll and Hyde is about. There, there was interest in split personalities. There was already some uh, case um reports of people with uh, split personalities of that were psychological problems, not just the Deacon Brody who was getting away with two laws. That's pretty fascinating because you kind of, there's so much, um, I guess, kind of hidden meaning to the book. Are there so many different ways to look at it? You must really have to 
think about this? And well, you think about it and you read a lot. I mean, I, as I said, I I started this out sort of um, saying, yeah, that's really a good book. I'll bet I can do something interesting with it. And then dove into the scholarship, the research, the work that others have done. I, I don't think of myself as a particularly creative person um, when I do these books. I, I think of myself as someone who can appreciate other people's work and try and sort of put it on display and uh, reference a lot. Um, so, for example, when I did uh, the stories of H.P. Lovecraft, I did two volumes of Lovecraft. Um, there's a huge amount of scholarship that I read through and tried to pull into um, references in in the work to, to show what other people had done and what, what they had thought about many, many issues. And you must really have to... Like when you're doing like this book, Jekyll and Hyde here, um, you must really have to find out about Stevenson, like um, so much that was going on during the time he wrote it. Like, you know. Yes. And- yeah. Well, so again, this is the Victorian period. So it's one that um, I felt pretty comfortable with. I have a depth of research material in the form of, Oh, I have an 1888 Britannica. I have a 1910 Britannica. I have a whole slew of Baydeckers from the time period, travel guides. I have slang dictionaries. I have uh, almanacs and medical texts and so on. So I love using those Victorian resources. Plus the internet has a tremendous amount of Victorian material available uh, in the form of magazines, uh, journals that were being published at the time and and books that are long out of print. So what what do you think about the movie ad- adaptations of these sort of things or the way that it goes to screen? I know I was recently listening to Frankenstein uh, on audiobook, and that was the first time for me, and I was surprised at how much more there was to the book. I almost thought when I was listening, I, maybe I was listening to the wrong book, it's, it's so different from what I grew up with. And it's like, wow, that's crazy. I mean, that must be work in itself to take something like this and turn it into a movie. Right. Well, so this happened. Uh, Frankenstein is a perfect example of, of this. And it, it happened again with with the Jekyll Hyde, which is that the book so caught the public attention that it was immediately and illegally, uh, because copyright laws were pretty loose, Um, put on the stage. And because it was the stage, it had to be, we'll get to film in a minute, but film had the same issues. Um, It had to be considerably simplified and, if you will, sort of focused, sharpened to be sort of one note. Uh, And in most cases, there had to be a romantic element introduced because that would be more appealing to an audience. So all of the adaptations of, of Jekyll and Hyde are distortions of the original story uh, because it's just sort of the nature of, uh, we'll say, we'll say that's Hollywood. You know, that's what happens when you make stage plays or movies out of a, out of a book where you can indulge in a lot of subtlety. Um, so all of the stage plays have romantic interests, uh, whereas the book uh, has essentially no women in it. There's one minor, minor woman character uh, in the story, but everybody else, everybody of any importance is a man. Um, and that doesn't play well on the screen. Um, you know, Hollywood wouldn't buy that version. Uh, so um, it, it got changed. And similarly... Dr. Jekyll becomes much more heroic, much more the victim um, than the book would credit him with. Similarly to Dr. Frankenstein. Um, And when you read Frankenstein, I'm sure you came to the conclusion that the real villain of that story is not the creature. It's Victor Frankenstein, who is a really awful father. Um, and that is not the message of the stage plays, uh, which focus on 
oh, he went too far as a scientist. He explored things. The title of the first stage play of Frankenstein was called Presumption, which says it all. It's, a, you know, sort of be careful what you research. And similarly, Jekyll and Hyde got into much the same sort of vein. It was, uh, you know, oh, poor Dr. Jekyll. He, he investigated things that he shouldn't have, and he let loose a monster. Well, that's not the theme of the book at all. The theme of the book is this is the real Hyde. This is real parts of Dr. Jekyll. As, as G.K. Chesterton said, you know, the great revelation of the book is not that Jekyll is two people. It's that Jekyll and Hyde are one person. Um, and uh, so Jekyll becomes all good in the stage and screen versions as opposed to being a normal human being with a lot of good parts and a lot of bad parts uh, as he's depicted in the book. Do you think there was a political motivation to it um, relating to the times? Sure, sure. Um, it was uh, uh, also about the hypocrisy of the politic of the politicians and the, and the people running the government, um, espousing great ideals and living lives that were secretly uh, sinful. Thank God they that's changed. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Well, I'll tell you, it has changed. It has changed considerably. Now everybody says, "Yeah, I'm an awful person." Isn't that great? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, no, it's funny. I, it's just, um, do you think the writing was better back then? Then no, but I think there was. I don't think it was better. I think there's some wonderful writers now. But but the, um, I, I guess I would say that there was more attention paid to writing because you know it, we have to keep reminding ourselves this is before radio, before television, before movies. So the only entertainment venue out there was basically books or books or the stage, um, which is like books in that it sort of was all about the script. Um, and so there was more interest in writing. This was a golden age for, uh, for writers and readers uh, as be because of t several developments, because of number one, the board schools, um, more and more education for the poor and the middle classes, um, and, and a lot of spread of reading. I mean, reading in the, in the 19th, in the 18th century, remember, was a pastime of the aristocratic classes. Uh, they're the only ones that knew how to read. Nobody else could read. So books were a luxury, um, but when we get to the 19th century, we have the white, we have the diverse, the, 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 uh, spread of education and we have more leisure time because of the railroads. We have people spending a lot of time twiddling their thumbs while they're on the train riding to or from the city or their other place of employment. And so they bought magazines and newspapers and read and read and read. So it was a golden age for writers and readers, I think. When someone was going to read and and even read a paper, they, you know, from my understanding, they would read page to page in every single article. Like it was very, like people devour it. They really got into it. Yes. Like it's not like someone today sitting on the train and flipping through the New York Times. It was, it was, yeah, that's right. It was their entertainment. You know, they didn't have, they couldn't text people. They didn't have things to watch on their phones. They didn't have movies or radio or television. So they read and they wanted to be entertained. I mean, we've forgotten, I think, that many of the great novels of the 19th century were published serially in newspapers. Um, and so... Uh, people's attention had to be grabbed, so they buy the next issue. Would you want to live back in those times? Oh no, I think no. that <laughs> you know. On, on the one hand, the Victorian age is fascinating to me because every—I I like to say—every revolution of the 20th century really was born then. Whether we're talking about the rights of women, uh, people of color, uh, the Industrial Revolution, the Communications Revolution, computers. You know, the explosion of science, all of that started in the 19th century. But we've also forgotten that London was a 
town filled with smoke and haze and horse manure. One of the things I talk about there is that because of the prevailing westerly winds, the uh, wealthy were on the west end where they would get that the winds from the countryside, the fresh air, and the east end, which was older, they got all that stuff you were just talking right. about. You know, it was an odiferous time in London, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, not uh, you know, we take all our modern conveniences uh, for granted, uh, whether it's uh, the water closet or the uh, uh, the running hot and cold water and all that, and uh, you know the the gas range, uh, electric lights. There were a lot of sort of hardships, or at least what we would regard today as hardships, of living in that time. Um, it, and, and it was not a good time to be a woman or a person of color. It was not a good time to be poor. Um, and uh, it, it was life was a struggle. On the other hand, every middle class household had a maid um, because you just had to. And they were plentiful. All those young Irish girls. Yeah, I think this, that's one of the biggest things people miss out on that time when they talk about, you know, uh, how good the times were back then. But they're not actually thinking about the person's day-to-day life, what, what they actually had to do just to get through the day, right. you know. Well, just you know, just I, dressing alone, my goodness. The amount of clothing that especially women had to wear uh, – and the efforts that they went to and the rigid constraints on things like mourning uh, and and dating and employment, uh, it was it was a restrictive time. It was also not a great time to be living in one of the colonies of the empire, although people like to think of that as a golden age, too. Not if you were living in India or Ireland or uh, any of the other many colonies. Uh, the United States was no longer a colony. But uh, it was a time when uh, it was great if you were one of the rulers, but not so great if you were one of the colonials. Including disease, that was yes. quite a uh, situation. Yes. Well, grooming's got to have been really difficult, too, back then. That's right. Uh, it, you know, it, it, shaving a haircut was a, a lot more effort, let's put it that way. Yeah, it wasn't something, it wasn't like you couldn't daily groom like we do now. You know, what a, what a different time. Um, what do you hope people get out of this? Like when you do something like this at the, at the end of it, like when someone picks this up and, and looks at it, and I see there's going to be over 100 color. Oh, absolutely. Well. And the, the images are great. I, I hope they walk away saying, um, gee, I didn't realize what a great book this really was. And not because Les Klinger is trumpeting it. That's not, it's not. That's not what I mean. What I mean is I think they will, I hope they will walk away having discovered aspects of the story that they had no idea were there and walk away uh, applauding Robert Louis Stevenson and the work of genius that he created um, that otherwise they may not, have, may not have paid attention to. I wonder what it was that particularly made certain one of these, like, was this Stevenson's only book? Oh, not at all. Uh, no. He was... Already known as a writer of works like Treasure Island, Kidnapped, and um, many other sort of adventure stories. Uh, he became, later scholars thought of him as just a children's author, but um, later scholars went back and read his other stuff and said, well, he had a lot of adult material that was pretty darn good. Um, no, this was not his first book or nor his best known book. And, and in fact, it was just sort of tossed off. He only took six weeks to write it. And um, I'm not sure it's his prime. I think probably he's best remembered for Treasure Island these days rather than Jekyll and Hyde. But, um, but, and while Treasure Island is a great book and one that fascinates me, it's not one that I wanted to particularly spend a lot of time with. I just, I'm still intrigued by 1886. When that came out, and then two years later, the, the Whitechapel murders occurred, and there was so much connection to that, because especially when they were thinking that Jack the Ripper was a Jekyll Hyde type person, where during yes. the day he was a prominent prominent physician at night, he was a medical maniac, you right. know, maybe looking for the elixir of life. 
And then, uh, so, I mean, it's just like they fed off each other. And I'm wondering, maybe even uh, Jack Ripper exploited that. <laughs> so Who knows? A, a, co- a copycat, maybe. Um, although we, we don't know much about the murder that takes place with Jack the Ripper, just that he murdered this guy. And it's, it's such a weird story uh, that uh, Sir Danvers was out posting a letter at one in the morning. Uh, and uh, And he meets Hyde and Hyde kills him in a fit of something rage who knows but um uh, yeah the the murder is so sort of inexplicable you you get the feeling that it's really secret code for something else that it was a, a homosexual assignation that went wrong or something like that and and of course i i think the, there were a lot of those i think there was a lot of that sort of thing actually happening um, and so I think the idea of that sort of late night violence was not strange to the reading public. Um, and so was the Ripper a copycat? I don't know. Could be. Well, interestingly, that uh, that Martha Tabram, who was murdered on August 6th, that was the one year anniversary of the execution of Henry Franzini, who was a Paris Ripper that killed, cut the throat of three women. That... Uh, and so that was a one-year anniversary of that, so of his execution. So, uh, and it definitely, Jack Ripper could be a Pranzini copycat too. <laughs> so, and here it is uh, at that time, right there. Especially if you have Bram Stoker's Dracula, what uh, what a kind of a mix. Absolutely, it's Dracula. I I believe Dracula took place in 1888. Um, I'm I'm not wholly alone in that view but it's not the popular view most people subscribe to the view it was 1893 but i believe it was 1888 smack in the middle of ripper time uh, when you look at a map of where dracula dracula had 11 spots around london where he kept boxes of soil uh if you map those out it's exactly where the Ripper murders took place. So is it true, then, that Bram Stoker dedicated the book to Henry Hall Kane, who, in fact, was a boyfriend one of the top Ripper suspects? <laughs> it is true. Uh, they so. were friends. Um, and, uh, yeah. So uh, they, they were longtime friends. I don't know that he knew about the Ripper connection, but... Uh, well, I, I do know that Bram Stoker at the Lyceum Theater, the Order of the Golden Dawn was started in 1888, and one of their goals was to look for the Philosopher's Stone or the Elixir of Life, and uh, and how coincidental that you know these vampires are immortal, and it, so it's so intriguing. I, it, it, uh, it's just fun. I mean, you know how many conspiracies. I know it's put a wonderful thing. stew. <laughs> so the writer who has mixed this stew best is my friend Kim Newman. Uh, if you haven't read his Anno Dracula series, uh, it's brilliant. Um, it, and it, it, and it has the Ripper very much in it. Uh, Anno, Anno, Dra- Anno. Anno. Anno okay. Dracula. And there's actually four or five novels in the series now, but the first of them is called Anno Dracula, one of the finest vampire novels ever written. And uh, Dr. Seward plays a material part in it, and I won't I don't want to give anything away, but the, let me just say the Ripper is very much involved in the story. So it's about, he basically imagines that um, the hunters, the crew of light of Dracula failed. Dracula survived. He's come to, he's in England. He actually ends up marrying Queen Victoria uh, and becoming the, uh, I mean, he is nobility, remember, he is a count. So he ends up uh, being sort of the ruler of England through Victoria, who becomes essentially his sort of slave. And it's it's a terrific book, um, very popular, and Kim Newman. So That's yeah. a heck of a royal conspiracy yes. then. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Neil's story has quite a bit to say about that too. I've, we've talked to him a few times about, uh, um, you know, this whole combination of people and stuff. I, I, it's just, it's just really bizarre. And the Sikh, you know, at the, it's sort of things get 
things get weird. Remember how we all thought was what we thought was going to happen in the end times of 1999? It was all happening in 1899 and, and the decade <laughs> before that. Uh, so, where you, where, what, what's up for you next? Are you are you going to? You must do like one every couple of years or something. You, you know, must take. Yes, I I haven't agreed with the publisher on the next title yet. We've been kicking around some ideas. Probably it'll be the Invisible Man. But meanwhile, I am uh, continuing to be busy with the Library of Congress Crime Classics series. We put out one of those essentially every three months. Those are lightly annotated um, editions of American crime classics. Um, uh, I just finished doing my annotations for uh, S.S. Van Dyne's The Canary Murder Case, uh, which is 1930. 1929, um, uh, Philo Vance, the great detective Philo Vance. Uh, we've done earlier stuff um, and we've done later stuff. So it's a real mix and it's a lot of fun to do those sort of in between the big books. Yeah, yeah it must be. Uh, so uh, how do you like people to find you? Are, are you doing a website, social media? Yes, there's, a, there's a, all of the above. There's a website, uh, leslieesklinger.com. Uh, which shows all my books and you can order them there if you, if you are so moved. Um, I'm on Twitter, uh, under the clever title of L Klinger. Um, and, uh, yeah, please, uh, look for me on social media and reach out. And, uh, I love, as you can tell, I love talking about these things. Well, we'll have that on our website as well. So people can find you with one click Great. in that. How was the pandemic for, for this type of research and work for you? Uh, you know, first of all, lawyers generally, I think, were super busy during yeah. the pandemic. I mean, uh, it, it was it was not a problem to um, not come in the office. I was able to get a tremendous amount of work done at home. So um, it didn't really affect my writing at all. Uh, it only affected my ability to go to conventions and see my friends. But um, I, I was able to devote a lot of time to writing. Um, because, but the same, the same as before. Yeah. Do you think that, you know, um, something like the pandemic that happens and the people that live through it and the writers that live through it, do you think it'll influence how they write in? And so, Absolutely. and, and Absolutely. in that same, same kind of line, uh, when these books were being written, like Jekyll and Hyde and Frankenstein and Dracula and stuff, how much of, of that Times issues would have would have affected what they wrote. Do you think it kind of seeps in somehow? Absolutely, and I think part of it's intentional. Um, I mean, one of the great things about crime writing, I've always said, is that by ver the very nature of the subject matter, it allows us to explore the dark side of modern of contemporary life. Um, and I, I think the same was true of the kind of genre fiction that was being written in the 19th century, whether it was about monsters um, or crimes um, or the even the supernatural. It allowed those writers to write about their own societies and criticize them without it being a social, you know, without it being a, a uh, uh, simply a, a, a social critique. I mean, nobody wanted to just write an essay about what's wrong with modern London. You know, they could do it better by telling a story that showed what was wrong with modern right. London. Um, so I think that's always been true for writers, that telling stories is a way to talk about the world out there. Um, and it's never been about just pure entertainment for the great writers. Right. There's always a subtext. There's always something that they want people to pick up. That's right. And it's and it, whether it's intentional or not. I mean, when you write a story about, uh, you know, Tess of the Durberville, um, you are writing about a social problem, um, you know, something that is really bothering you because that's what makes an interesting story. It, it's not much of a story to write about uh, Les Klinger and his life uh, practicing law. You know, people see, say to me, why don't you write something about it? Well, because it's a, I won't say it's a boring life. It's just not a life that has a story that anybody else would want to read. 
you don't have a Mr. Hyde side? That... <laughs> well, oh, oh yeah. Tell you. Yeah, well, you see, this is what we got to get on paper. Right. The Mr. Hyde side for me is my writing life. Yeah, yes. Well, there you go. Uh, <laughs> well, what, do you, what did you find out about Robert Louis Stevenson that you didn't know, or was there any surprises? Um, yeah, I didn't really understand that he was this, as I said earlier, that he was also a, a conflicted person who basically struggled with reconciling the expectations of his family um, with his own personal interests of, of of being an artist. Um, I, I didn't really know that about him at all. Um, and, uh, so that was a revelation and it's, and it's all there in the stories. Once you, once you know that, you start to see that that, that, that was part of his subtext, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty amazing what you can pick up about people, about writers. If you, it's really like Lovecraft. Them. Uh, uh, one of my editors said to me, wow, when I read your introduction about Lovecraft, Lovecraft, you know, has written these stories that are so weird. And when you find out that his biography is that both of his parents died in the insane asylum. Oh, boy. It becomes like, yeah, wow, that <laughs> explains a lot. Well, this has been a great show. I, I find you very interesting. And, and of course, uh, the new book. Um, it's the new annotated strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And, of course, our guest is the author of that, Leslie S. Klinger. Thank you for being on the show. My pleasure, Alan. It's great speaking with you, Les. Same here, Michael. Good luck with your uh, Ripper talk here. So. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.